Hello, and welcome back once again to the Inquisitor podcast with me, Marcus Kauke. Today, my guest is Chris Beal. He is the CEO of Connect and Sell. Chris, welcome. Marcus, it is tremendous to be here. I agree. Excellent. Would you mind giving 60 seconds on your history, please, so people understand your background? Sure. So I'm a kid who grew up out in the desert in Arizona. I had books and animals, so I didn't learn much about people. Turned out that was a good thing. Took up an interest in lots and lots of things, including math and physics, and ended up getting a degree in physics and doing well in math. And you know what you do with a degree in physics? Uh, it's like Willie Sutton said about banks, you know, you, you rob them because that's where the money is. So yeah. I went into the software world because that's where the money was clearly going to be. This was in the 70s. It was obvious that software is going to eat the world. But why not go there? And uh, one thing led to another. I, I'm unemployable. Nobody can stand me as an employee. So I started building my own companies. Excellent. Okay. So you and I have had some really interesting preamble chats. And one of the things that we talked about was the role of the human voice in sales as AI and automation become you know, de rigueur. Let's uh, talk about that. Because obviously, connect and sell is very much about the human voice. And I'm really curious about your take on this and the the future of sales and salespeople. Sure, absolutely. Well, I think the bedrock of sales, I'm I'm talking B2B sales. I don't know shit about B2C, right? I'm I'm not being a good consumer. I don't even know how to go on a boat like that one behind me because I wouldn't know what to do there as a consumer, right? But B2B, I've been involved with for a long time. And yes, you said connect and sell. We help people have lots and lots of B2B conversations. Here's the one thing I've learned about B2B that I believe will never change. And that is the B2B buyer is scared out of their wits because they're about to make a decision that affects their career. So it's one thing to put your money on the line and buy a Tesla. But if you don't like the Tesla, you find out you're allergic to electricity or something like that, (laughs) then you can dump the Tesla, right? And you might be out a few grand, no big deal. But if you buy the Tesla equivalent for your business based on all the promises that some vendor made and all your research and all your, it's going to integrate, it's going to do great. And then it sucks and it hurts your business. Your reputation is trashed. So that's your kid's college education, your retirement, everything's on the line. It's very, very different from your money. Your money, you can replace your reputation. You can't. So the B2B buyer is cautious and always uninformed. Because the poor shot, what are they going to do? It's like, wait, you're the vendor, Marcus. You're selling to me. Who's the expert? It can't be me or I'd be selling to you. So you're the expert. And I got to trust you with my career. So how do I ever get to the point of trusting another entity? So now I have two choices. I'm either going to trust you, the human being, or I'm going to trust your corporation. Well, no one in their right mind has ever trusted a corporation because we know what they're in it for. There's no doubt about that. But we are very easily, I'm not going to say persuaded, experience with somebody over a matter of a few seconds can lead to us trusting them as another human. And here's where the AI comes in. So now there's only two possibilities. I got a bot that is so persuasive. You think it's me. You talk to it. It passes the Turing squared test, right? It's like, you are sure it's me, except for one little thing. Ethically, the corporation owning the bot that claims to be Chris Beale has got to tell you it's a bot. We can't hide that from you. That doesn't work. So I've got a problem. As the corporation, I feel the bot that's so good that you think it's me, but you can't trust the bot because I got to tell you it's a bot. And you're not going to put your career on the line, your reputation on the line for a corporation's trust, but you will for a human. So the human being is essential And it's the human voice that carries the information that allows us to trust another person. And it takes about seven seconds, according to the FBI. I'm not an expert. I said it was eight seconds, but Chris Voss said it was seven seconds. So I'm going with Chris. Okay. So this then raises some really interesting questions for me around the importance of trust and how one builds that. One of my mentors, Charlie Green, develop the trust equation. So reliability plus credibility plus integrity over low self-orientation or over self-orientation. And I was having a coaching session with him a couple of weeks back, and he made the point that integrity is the most important lever. 
uh, and uh, sorry, intimacy is the most important lever because that's where there's that human to human connection. In my experience, buyers are incredibly distrustful of salespeople. And I'd like to unpack why, first of all. I have my own theories, but I'd love to hear yours. Why is it salespeople are largely untrustworthy or untrusted? Yeah, I think the reason is, is that last one. It's a self-orientation. Buyers rightly suspect salespeople of having 100% self-orientation. And so you can't crush the denominator very easily. To go and claim you have no self-orientation makes you even worse, right? I'm in it for you. It's like, I'll give you a, an analogy. Is it just a, in a different area? So you're interviewing somebody for a job and they tell you they're a team player. Do you hire them? Are you kidding me? Nobody hire, nobody in their right mind hires somebody who says they're a team player because you know they're a parasite. Mm -hmm. And that's why they say they're a team player because otherwise they wouldn't have to say it, right? <laughs> so the salesperson's in a bind where a declaration of low self-orientation, self-interest is counterproductive. And you know, everybody knows the situation. So it, it really, I think it comes down to this. At the very, very beginning of the relationship, very beginning, before anybody knows who's who, can you get the beginning of trust from intimacy before this question of self-orientation comes up? That is, can you break the trust ice? And I think that's actually the key. I think your, your mentor is dead on. It's a intimacy. It, when we think of intimacy, we tend to think of it in a squishy kind of way, right? We go, oh, intimacy, that's like whatever. Well, intimacy kind of has an information theory aspect element to it, which is when you're intimate with somebody, you're exchanging a huge of information, amount of information with them. And you're doing it quickly before they decide not to do it anymore with you. Anybody who's ever been in a bar scene or whatever knows that there's a dance and it's got to occur and it's got to occur relatively fast and it's delicate. And so for a salesperson, I think it comes down to what Chris Voss told me, which is you got seven seconds of intimacy, the human voice, to allow somebody to uh, sort of trip and fall into a trust relationship with you that's got a little bit of trust. Then you can work on the other questions. Now the question of integrity. You better make them a promise of some kind and you better keep it. How long do you have to do that? Probably 30 seconds. Then you got two out of three. Self-orientation, you're gonna have to wait on that one. <laughs> you're gonna have to wait to prove yourself there. So I, I think you can get two out of three and get to the point where somebody trusts you enough to have a meeting with you. I think there's some really interesting things to build on that because I've been selling now for 35 years and I have to admit the first 10 were a bloodbath. Anyone I tried to sell to, if you're listening to this, I am so sorry. It must have been a terrible experience. But what, what's been really interesting is observing how important listening is. I interviewed someone for the podcast yesterday and, uh, about a concept called story listening. And the whole idea of, of that is that you listen your way to have the customer tell their story. And through well thought through, through or well crafted questions, the other person opens up. And what, what flabbergasts me is that listening appears on almost no sales training curriculum. Virtually no sales manager on the planet teaches it. It's not taught at school, uh, and uh, uh, you're told, shut up and listen. But you're not really taught how to listen. You're told how to hear and sit there and absorb information. But listening is so much more than just hearing the words. It's hearing the pauses, what's omitted, the undertone. It's uh, a whole body experience. And even on the phone, it's very possible to really engage through very proactive listening. But it strikes me that the single most important skill of any salesperson is the ability to listen and be fully present. But almost no one learns that. And you have to learn it through tripping up, beating your head against the wall. Um, and eventually, it might sink in. But th the experience of buying from salespeople is generally pretty atrocious. 
precisely because they don't pay any attention. They're so fixated on what they can say next. Any light that you can shed on why this carries on? Well, I can I can make one distinction that I think is interesting. So there's two, exactly two kinds of sales conversations, and they're so different from each other that until we make this distinction, it's really easy to conflate a whole bunch of things and then make recommendations that people do stuff that can't possibly work in one of the conversations, but you must do in the other and you must do it really, really well. So the the, the kind of conversation that I've gotten intimate with is this first com- first unscheduled conversation, what you call the cold conversation, not a cold call. Cold calls end up in voicemail, but the cold conversation where you're with the human. And in that conversation, you are the ambusher and that other person is almost never going to get in a psychological state where they're ready to confess anything to you. Not right then. They have one and only one goal which is to get off that call with their self-image intact. And if you can align with that goal and allow them to get off that call with their self-image intact and trust you, you've won. If you can get them to both trust you and be curious enough to want to talk to you again someday, then you've like you've won gold medals all over the place, right? That's the scheduled meeting, even the verbal. So in that conversation, the listening that you do is oddly structured because there are only so many ways that somebody can respond to being ambushed. I was talking to a guy I went sailing, um, was fortunate enough to be invited onto a, a crew of a regatta. I don't know how to sail. I make really good ballast, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm a very attractive guy. I'm, I'm attractive to the center of the earth. So, you know, I do the ballast, right? And we're, we're talking about this, set of questions around when is it okay to do different things? And, you know, the sailing paradigm is a really good one. There are things that when you're in the process of getting the boat out there, getting the sails up and all that, that if you were to, you, if you were to do those things during the race, you'll lose the race. And if you do the things you do during the race, all the trimming of sails and all you, you got to get this stuff in, in the right order. And the confession part that that you hope to get in sales, you're hoping to get the person to confess what's true about their world, will not happen in that first conversation before you cross the start line of the race, so to speak. So you've got to be simple-minded in your goal. And you've got to be prepared, stereotyped, essentially. It's, it's really weird because you have to be warm, open, vulnerable, truly believing in the potential value of what you're offering, which is a meeting, all these kind of soft things. And yet you're stereotyped because you're very early in the game and there's only so many dance moves and you don't want to act like you're inventing, reinventing conversation. I think once you go into the discovery meeting, listening is super important and helping to set up the emotional setting so that somebody is comfortable talking to you about their reality so that you can listen. So there's something to listen to is key. Like I open discovery meetings like this. I'd say, hey, Marcus, where are you on the face of our blue whirling planet? Now that has nothing to do with business, but it does have something to do with you and me, which is, hey, we're both on this earth. You know, we share a lot, right? We breathe air, we have that water, look at the earth from far away. We are two little teeny ant like dots on that planet somewhere. That question embodies that, but it also allows that person to speak with pride about where they live. And pride is exactly the opposite of what they intended to come to that conversation with. So by letting them speak with pride, listening really, really carefully, and then being open to either saying something about your experience with their place or whatever it is, right? Having that little conversation, totally changes the relationship because now you've proven you will listen and it's about them, not you. Interesting. Okay. Um, you've obviously never been to Alsmore where I lived before because uh, it's not necessarily something to speak with pride about. But you would, you would. I guarantee you everybody is proud of where they live. I have never met a person who isn't. They've chosen to do it. Very few of us have like an ankle bracelet on that says we can't leave except during lockdown. And uh, we're there because we're there. And actually, what's really interesting is the less obviously attractive a place is to others, 
the more the people who live there are proud of being there. Okay, I'm going to agree to disagree because there's nothing <laughs> to be proud of. Um, but I, I, I get it. A lot of people will be. I'm really curious about the initial opening conversation, though. Uh, you guys do 40 million cold calls a year. So I, I suspect you're quite proficient. That's a lot of practice. And I, I'm really curious, um, first of all, about how you're encouraging your people to make that initial call. Because most cold call attempts are a bloodbath. And as you said, the recipient is trying to get off that phone as quickly as humanly possible. So what advice would you give to people? On well, first phone? I'll make the sharp distinction between the cold call, which is an attempt to get somebody on the phone, and a cold conversation, which is the successful attempt to get them on the phone. Because okay. the reason okay. that most reps won't make the cold call is not actually their concern. The first order reason is not their concern about what might happen if somebody answers like a target, their concern is one more time, I've done my research, I'm ready to have this conversation, I think I am anyway, and ah, oh, damn, voicemail. Now what? That's not a conversation, that's an advertisement. So once you're past that, you know, I, I know what we do about that. I mean, that's our whole business. You push a button, you talk to somebody, great. You're not gonna have to go through that shit, right? You're just gonna push a button, you're gonna wave, pet the dog, you know, try to stay on your feet. and. Um, Yes, <laughs> see how see how it goes to wait. When that bloop goes off in your ear and it pops up on your screen and shows you who you're talking with, now it's showtime. Here's how, how I advise people. First, recognize the truth. That person is afraid of you. And that's why you were afraid to have this call. You don't like being the invisible stranger that scares somebody else. It's the oldest of the fears. Invisible stranger, the invisible strangers from across the river, they dress funny. They paint their faces this way. And we all know civilized people paint our faces vertically. They put a bone in their ear and we all know we have a bone in our nose. And when they're invisible, it's nighttime. They're here at night, uninvited, not good ever for at least a few hundred thousand years. So here we are in a situation where we are voluntarily being a terrible thing. And nobody likes that. That's what reps really don't like. It's that sick feeling that I'm just about to be a bad thing. I'm not going to do a bad thing. I'm worse than that. I'm going to be a bad thing. <laughs> so I encourage reps to think like this. Look, you're going to be a bad thing. It's wonderful. It gives you power because you have the power to go away. You now share your imperfect alignment with the person you just ambushed. They want to get off the phone with their self-image intact, that's really important, with their self-image intact. Otherwise, everybody would just hang up. They don't. They don't. They would, you know, if they only cared about getting off the phone, they'd get off the phone. I mean, they have that power, right? But they don't want to think of themselves as an asshole. Yeah. It's just yeah. they don't. So that's where your power comes from is when you scared them and you know it. The, the knowledge that you frighten them is power because you, if you relieve that fear, they'll trust you. We always trust whoever relieves fear. We, this is inborn and trained both. So relieve the fear, and you can do it in two sentences, and allow them to make a simple deal with you, and now you can show your integrity by keeping your word. And that's kind of all it takes. It's so simple, and yet most reps go the other way. I'm afraid. I've got to be brave. i got to do it. Oh, damn, another call didn't go through. Oh, now I got you. <gasps> now i got to tell you how great I am. And as soon as you tell them how great you are, they're going to push back and say, no, you're not. They won't say it out loud. So what is that two-sentence contract? It goes like this. You pop up on the screen, and I hear the bleep. It says, Marcus, cool, right? If I'm a good reader, I can use your name. If I'm not, mm, I'm not going to use your name. But I'm a good reader, so I'm going to say, Marcus, Chris here from Connect and Sell. I know I'm an interruption. Can I have 27 seconds to tell you why I call? And the key is I hammer the word no and I throw myself under the bus instantly. Before you're quite ready to throw me under the bus, you're, already, you're starting to feel like, oh, shit. why did I answer this call, right? But you're not quite there indicting me for being a bad thing. But I'm going to indict myself faster than you can indict me. And now that game's over. 
Now we agree. I, you see, I see the world through your eyes. You think I'm a bad thing. I know I'm a bad thing. We know I'm a bad thing. I know I'm an interruption. You have to hammer it really hard and you can't change it. You can't soften it. You can't go like, Marcus, I know that I'm interrupting your day because I'm not interrupting your day. I am a bad thing. I'm an interruption. I'm the invisible stranger. Then you switch your voice to playful curious as an FBI term. And you go to this little, it's really a funny little voice. It's like, can I have 27 seconds to tell you why I call? And it lets you off the hook. It offers a solution to the problem. What's the problem? Me. I'm the problem. Reps don't want to be the problem, so they want to jump to value. It's like, you know, whatever they're going to say, right? Well, Marcus, you know, uh, my company has helped hundreds of companies like yours accomplish things that could not be done otherwise of incredible value. And you should immediately just start writing me checks because I'd sure like a commission. <laughs> this then raises the other question. Given that we know that just diving into a pitch about product and features and functionality doesn't work. Why? I mean, the, the evidence is out there, but the results are not. The evidence says that your data, it's 33 dial attempts to get through to a senior decision maker, 46 if they're a senior decision maker in IT, and one in 14 effectives goes through to a first meeting. The mathematics on that is 426 at the bottom end, 426 dials to get to one meeting. And then you add to that the fact that most salespeople are really terrible when they turn up. So one in eight first meetings result in a second. Now, that means that you're, you're wasting 2,500 dials every time you send a rep on first meetings because they blow it. So there must be a smarter way of doing things that means that you're relevant and you have value to the other person. But almost nobody does good calls and they don't have good conversations. It's just a dance to see who can get hung up first. Yeah, yeah. What's I management we... going to do about this? Yeah, well, what we recommend people do about it is uh, help your reps get a lot better and do it in a setting where they have a shot of actually learning and don't leave them on their own to reinvent sales. I mean, let's face it. We tell reps, be yourself. Really? I mean, that rep by being themselves is going to be, you know, a linguistic psychological genius and figure out how to handle the world's most awkward conversation all on their own. How many years did it take you? You said at the very beginning, before you became a not horrible salesperson? That's, well, I mean, that, that was probably 30 to 50 cold calls a day for 10 years. Yeah, exactly. And those cold calls back then went through to a decision maker, how often? Maybe one in five? Actually, back in the old days before voicemail, a lot more frequently, um, if you could be asked to go to the library and pull off um, a decent list, but it was hard work. I mean, proper graft. And now you've got access to all this information from the likes of Zoom Info, Cogniz, and electric marketing and whatever. Um, but now people are, are blocked by gatekeepers, by voicemail, and they don't pick up their numbers from uh, unknown uh, callers. You've got caller ID. So I think it's a lot harder nowadays than it was back in those days. So I reckon one, yeah, well, one in three to one in five would not be unreasonable back then. Yeah, and now it's, I'm looking at some numbers right here of a big commercial insurance company. They're calling CFOs of $100 million revenue and above companies, and their number is 34.39 dials to get a connect. So if you were to cast that in the world of 50 a day, they're talking to 1.3 people a day or 1.2 or something, right? Yeah. So that's our whole business is, is taking that down from – if from the world of the dials, we take care of that. We make the dials, the navigation, going to voicemail over and over, just go away. I mean, we do it and it's gone and it's fast. And so we change the denominator from dials to time. That's it. I mean, time is what counts. You only have so many hours, minutes, whatever in a day. So the question is, how many conversations can you have? First order question. 
is this, this is not the quality question. This is the first order question. How many conversations can you have per prospecting hour? That's a key question. So here is, I'm looking at this guy, chief sales officer of this company, 63 conversations with decision makers and senior decision makers in nine hours, 30 minutes and 12 seconds. So in just north of a full day of prospecting, right? If you were to prospect all day, and he's a chief sales officer, so he's busy doing other things. 63 conversations. So, you know, that's that's 50 a day, roughly, roughly speaking, right? 50 a day. Wow. And at 50 conversations a day, now we're down to the simpler question, which is, well, can he turn those into a verbal agreement to meet, to get together? Because now meeting is easier because of all the virtual stuff. So the logistics around meeting have meetings have collapsed. The only place costs have, have gone down in sales, other than what you talked about with the data, which is great. You can go find data, better data, sliced and diced, you know, targeted. You think it's targeted anyway, all that kind of good stuff. But also another thing that's happened is the cost of getting to or holding a meeting like this one we're having, very, very inexpensive. I don't have to get on an airplane. I don't have to get in my car. It just happens. So if my goal is get trust and get a verbal meeting, and I've got 63 conversations, what should I be able to convert? So this particular gentleman converted out of those 63 conversations, 48 of them into meetings. Now, how did he do that? One, he truly believes in the potential value of the meeting for this other person. He knows the meeting is the product, so he doesn't talk about the product. He just goes with curiosity about the meeting. And he has deep conviction that the meeting itself has value, even if they never do business together. So that's number one is that belief. You have to have that belief. That means as a salesperson, you need to understand your product. The product is the meeting. So how many salespeople, I, I'd ask this question. What percentage of salespeople, if you ask them, tell me the three things your, customer, your prospect will learn from a discovery meeting that will be difficult for them to learn any other way and that will have value for them if they never do business with you? How many reps could answer Fabulous this question? question. That was with the price of admission. And the answer is zero. I mean, unless, unless we've trained them, the answer is zero. And that's the whole game. Because okay. then, then the math changes. Now you're in a world where your dial to meeting goes from, what do you say, 450 at the low end? This company, and these are people who are being trained. These are trainees, never used the phone before in their life to speak of. You know, They're uh, schmoozers. These are people who take people to lunch, the golf course, et cetera, et cetera. And they've, they've learned a new way of doing things from scratch. So it's costing them, it's costing 180.22 dials to get a meeting. And 180.22 dials takes with Connect and Sell just about 45 minutes. So now they're getting a meeting on the books, so to speak, a verbal for a meeting every 45 minutes on average. Now the game becomes tractable. Now it becomes tractable, but you've got to turn those meetings into second meetings at a higher rate than one and eight. And that means you've got to be open to the truth of the situation, which is you promised to teach them something at the meeting. That's the value. You better do it. You got to, that's the integrity thing. You got to keep that promise. Absolutely. If you don't have anything to offer, don't have the meeting, but it's not your damn product. Yeah, I mean, no one in the history of humanity has ever bought a product or a service. They buy the outcome. And they don't even buy it. They rent it. If, if your product stops delivering the outcome that they intended, you're dropped and they're going to find another solution. So, okay, this has been really interesting. I, I want to move on to another really important theme that I know is near and dear to your heart. It's also near and dear to mine. Sales is such an essential component of uh, a business. But so often, there is a massive misunderstanding, if not a misalignment, between sales and pretty much everywhere else in the business. But I always remember that Dilbert cartoon, which is that uh, the, the salespeople and they've got technical people in the meeting. And the two salespeople said, uh, we'll let the geeks get on with it while we, whilst we make out. And sales is almost justifiably because most of them are not salespeople. At best, they're order takers. Most of them are zookeepers. 
And uh, in fact, I, I think most of them don't even qualify as that. And what I'm struggling with is why sales is so often in misalignment with the rest of the business. Can we investigate that for a while? Okay, so here's, here's uh, the, I'll give the brief history of sales in the capitalist world. And I'm talking factory capitalism, which is the essence of how our economies have been built up till recently. So in the factory capitalist world, capital is applied, right? money is applied in order to turn it into plant and equipment and access to, to raw materials. And you made things, and those things can come out of a factory at a certain pace. And so you, you got to sell them as fast as you make them. So what do you do? You hire salespeople, you put them in territories, and their job is to dispose of the inventory at sufficient gross profit to keep the lights on in the business and with luck allowing you to expand. That's the essence of all of business, right? So sales was always an externality. You put a salesperson in a territory and they basically dump inventory into that territory. And they did a remarkable thing that which we've forgotten about. They nurtured that territory. They did sales and marketing. They took care of the present and the future because the present yielded commission checks and the future yielded a business that they felt like they owned, which is that territory. And that's traditional sales. So sales sits outside. Sales management consisted of hire a rep, put them in a territory, tell them more stories about how great you were back in the day, because that makes you feel good like you're a manager. And then when they don't work out, replace them. That, I believe, is the history of sales management. So it's a, it was aligned with that business. But now sales in the modern world has got a completely new role, which is market exploration, market penetration, bringing back information, making competitive moves, stuff that used to show up in textbooks about strategy, which was all executed by M&A. Strategy was always about buying companies, always, always, always. And suddenly it's like, oh, shit, now sales has got to do that. So that means sales has got to be something other than, hey, here's your territory, go to it. And if it doesn't work out, I'll get rid of you. It's got to be aligned with who do you want to sell to? Because everybody now knows markets are organized around self-referencing folks who, you know, if I buy, then you might buy. That means you're in the market. If I buy and you won't buy or you don't care, then we're not in the market together. So we have to actually go to market. People have the term right, but they don't get what it means, which is, First, you have to make a list. That's your market. Then you've got to figure out how to get discovery meetings with them to get their truth. Then you have to figure out if your product actually fits. You might have to adjust your product. There's all these other informational roles that sales plays, information going in and out, and long-term roles beyond this quarter or even this year. And we don't hire sales leaders to do that. Here's how I can tell. The average tenure at firing of a VP of sales is 17 months. I, QED, I'm done. That's the whole argument. I don't need to argue anymore on this. If sales was actually part of the organization in terms of how it's done, not just what it needs to do, but how we actually do it, you wouldn't be firing your VP. Of, can you imagine firing your VP of engineering in 17 months? Phil McGowan did his PhD. And one of the really important uh, bits of output is that a salesperson hits their full stride after three years. Now, the turnover, the revolving door in sales, sales management, sales leadership is ludicrously high. And there, there are some really endemic problems there because you, you you've touched on the role of sales, but I think there's a huge misalignment between what the sales organization is asked to do and what leadership expect of sales and what investors expect the leadership to insist on sales doing. So I have a, an ongoing love-hate relationship in that I love to hate them, uh, that investors are fucking parasites by and large. They take perfectly great businesses and then... You know, you've got these companies really trying to solve a problem and they get close and intimate with their customers and then investors come in and then they change the metrics to revenue, new logos and pipeline. And the customers has forgotten afterthought, the end of this long chain of abuse. At the end of every quarter, 
you rape and pillage the uh, the next um, quarter's pipeline to try and make up for the stuff that your management was too dumb, too lazy, or too, too ignorant to help the salespeople focus on 12, 16, 18 weeks ago. And then everybody feels this enormous pressure. And they don't think about the unintended consequences of seemingly small decisions. If you take out, if you've got to make up a couple of hundred grand in order to hit your quota for this uh, quarter, and your MRR is 6K, that means that you've got to make another 36 sales, which you take from the next quarter's quota um, pipeline. But then you give a discount. Let's pretend it's as um, low as 30%. I've seen 80% more than once. Now, but let's pretend it's 30%. That means that instead of 36, you've got to take 48 sales out of next quarter's pipeline. Now, based on those numbers, just to get the first meeting, you're talking 462 dials, okay? And then you've got the 14 times multiplier. You are now talking about a tariff on, on the sales operation of tens of thousands of additional dials so that then becomes this downward spiral, which then creates more pressure for management because it's them that it will get it in the neck. Uh, they then put pressure on their salespeople, so they end up firing them. Um, so no one ever hits their stride. They spend all of their time, instead of coaching and developing their people and focusing on helping them to build their pipe, um, they spend all of their time recruiting more mediocre salespeople who aren't going to work out. And I was talking to a chap earlier on, and they got a 50% attrition rate within eight months. We see that all the time. I mean, we see... That's not even high, though, for the industry. Yeah, it's not even high. And how, how long, how much of that eight months was spent, quote, unquote, onboarding? Uh, well, they, they didn't onboard them. But what they do is they give them a telephone director and say, congratulations, you're a salesperson. Off you go. <laughs> That's pretty much the onboarding for most people. You might get a couple of days of crappy product training, and because that's all you know, you talk about product, which then speaks back to your earlier point, um, which is no one gives a fuck. Yeah, I think that I can't tell if they do or don't. What I know is they don't know what to do. They don't know how to break out of the cycle. They don't know where to start. They remind me of a dog walking around and around in circles because it can't figure out where to lie down. And it's like, well, you, you got to start by lying down. Some <laughs> you just got to lie down, right? Yeah. So. Here's the interesting part to me about all of that. That is all absolutely true. And it's probably in a sense, it's even worse than that because also the investors, at least venture investors, actually plan on your failure. And your failure is essential to their model. So as soon as you don't show that you're going to be that big marvelous unicorn thing, whatever it is, their time is precious. All the the people who are taking the money think, oh, I'm taking the money. That must be what's precious to them. No, the world's awash in money. Money's not the issue. The issue is time. And when you show that you're no longer potentially worth the time of that venture partner who's paying attention to you, you will be actively jettisoned without knowing it's happening to you. And there are various techniques to do it. I've been around Silicon Valley for 40-something years. I thought I'd seen them all. I've actually seen a couple of new ones recently, but trust Sorry, me. by text. Yeah, exactly. You're being dumped. You're being dumped, and there's a lot of ways to do it. Oh, you know, we're not. We're, we're actually not going to support you in the next round. Go get it yourself. Right? Mm -hmm. uh, you're being dumped. So you you got to be careful who you take money from if you're, you know, if you're an entrepreneur, you're a principal, because that money is coming with a hidden condition, which is. They might decide that they really made a mistake, and that's okay because 19 out of 20 are mistakes. That's their business model. So, you know, be a little cautious about that. What you do about it, regardless of where you are in business, it turns out the big issue is actually uncertainty. Mm. The fact is, no single deal ever comes with certainty. And in fact, the amount of uncertainty around a deal is always unknown. So there's only one thing that we do rationally in the face of lots of uncertainty. We build a big portfolio and we work from statistics instead of individual cases. That's the only way to manage uncertainty that's known to mankind is, ah, shit, we better go get a whole bunch. 
So the question is, how fast can you get a whole bunch? And at what stage are there? So here's the two huge, huge mistakes that I see sales, sales leaders, but even worse, business leaders. And I'll go all the way up to the investors not getting. They think pipeline is what's going to close this quarter or next quarter. But your pipeline actually is significant for 12 quarters because the replacement cycle for everything in B2B is three years. So you have a three-year replacement cycle during which this quarter represents one-twelfth of all the ideal customers that you have, the perfect market that are in a consideration period, even possibly for your category of product. That's it, one-twelfth. So 11 twelfths are not in market. So what do we do? We go, let's go cheap. Let's turn them over to marketing, to nurture. But marketing can't nurture because nurturing is really what it sounds like. It has to do with the relationship. And you can't have a relationship with a corporation. You can't have a relationship with content. You can only have a relationship with a person. So here you've got this salesperson who is the key to the other 11 twelfths, not just robbing from the next quarter, but instead of building a portfolio that covers everybody in the market today and then systematically nurtures them with one conversation per quarter until they're ready to buy from somebody, and now it'll be you because you nurtured them, you know, instead of doing that, we go, we go well, where's, where's this quarter? Well, the quarterly plans it crazy. Your first quarterly plan should be this. What's the count of folks in, mar- in the market that is, they made it into our list? So first order, here's what the big mistake everybody makes. They don't make a list. They think a market is a notion. A market is always a list. It's not a list just of companies, but it's a list of companies with people that you want to talk to there. Until you make that list centrally, you don't have a market. Without a market, you have no hope of doing well in the market. How could you? Can't work, right? You got to make the list. So step one, you got to make the list. Step two is you have to build trust relationships all the way across that list as fast as possible. Step three is you take the ones into meetings that will come into meetings and you close what you can close. And that's good. And step four is you nurture everybody else and keep repeating this for 12, 11 more cycles. This is really interesting. I've uh, just been developing a model for one of my clients specifically on this issue because the three critical problems that I see are cannibalization because of what we talked about earlier, uh, trying to make this quarter's quota by pillaging from next quarter's pipeline. The second is the shocking level of underperformance Beck Holland did some uh, her research for her book, Flip the Script. And what she found was uh, in Silicon Valley, 75% of SDRs missing quota, 85% of account executives not even achieving 75% of quota. And the stat that I heard yesterday, and I won't pin down the source, is that only 3% of sales teams globally are hitting quota. That's down from 13% in 2019, which is pretty piss poor. And the other is that they spend all of their life trying to sell into the cold market when if they actually nurtured pipeline and they understood the value of strategic partnerships, they could always be selling hot. And this is a huge problem because what um, the research that uh, friends that both of us, Sales Driven, have found is that the average SDR is wasting 120 hours per month on dead activity. Now, in a 4.3-week month, that is a shitload of salary that's being wasted. It's an opportunity cost that no CFO should be willing to accept. The the fact that it goes on. I mean, tell me this. If your health and safety people your manufacturing people, your QAs, your finance department operated at a level where 1% effectiveness was considered to be okay and industry standard. How long would it be before the company was bankrupt? Uh, How long would it be before your CFO was probably in jail for um, incredible levels of incompetence? And how many of your staff would be dead? if you operated at those sorts of levels. But apparently in sales and marketing, that's all fine and dandy because that's the way it is. That's a whole pile of steaming horseshit. It's an obscenity. So 
<laughs> I agree. I agree. The average sales rep works for three minutes a day. The average SDR. If you consider productive work to be actually having a live conversation with a human being who might change something they do in the future in a way that's relevant to your business at some point in the future, if that's your job as an SDR, three minutes a day is how much they work, which is exactly, it's actually a little worse than the numbers you're, you're quoting. That's not even 1%. So there's more than 300 minutes in a day. Jeez. So three minutes a day, three one-minute conversations. They're incompetent in general because they don't get to practice. Three minutes a day isn't much practice. Imagine trying to become a great golfer. I'm going to let you practice for three minutes a day. How many centuries is it going to take before you can actually hit a fairway, right? Well, it's, it's strange. You know, it's wild, but it's allowed. But the, the, again, the fact that the standards of the unprofessional sales allow for that and consider that to be acceptable is a, a truly damning indictment. So let me come back to the original question around sales alignment with the business. Internally, how can sales be considered anything other than a bunch of time-wasting freeloaders who are overpaid and over here? That's a really good question. I I, uh, I know how we do it, but I cheated. So my VP of sales is a big cash investor in the company. And so he's, <laughs> he's aligned. <laughs> I tell you what, everybody out there, just do this. Take your biggest investor or one of your biggest investors, hire him as your VP of sales and your alignment problems are over. <laughs> <laughs> now you're just down to competency. <laughs> There's nothing else that's left, right? They will want the outcome because they're not moving on in 17 months. And that's that's part of the problem. You know, I think that it's one of these things. I mean, I know what we do about it, and I know why we do it like this. We actually don't talk about this very much. This is very, like, I can talk about it to the world, like, you know, with you, right? I can come out and have a chat. But in fact, with customers, we don't talk about it. We just say, here's the deal. It starts with making a good list, a good enough list, not a great list, a good enough list and talking to people on that list. And you need to do it at about 10x what you're doing today. And that'll be the first order thing. And we're going to give that to you for free for one day. Because until you feel 10x, you can't figure out how you might align sales with the business. Because the misalignment is actually a decoupling. You have good intentions, put numbers up there. Here's a quota. Here's the plan. But you actually, it's like, it's like a car that's got an engine over here and it's got a transmission over here and they forgot to install the clutch. Mm -hmm. You can't couple one to the other. And so all you can do is make noise on the engine and then look at the speedometer and go, oh, we're not going very fast. <laughs> you know, and if you're going downhill, you have product market fit, you're going downhill. Then you drive the car and the transmission, which is the sales, you know, is back there going, well, we're great. Look at the contribution we're making. Well, no, you're going downhill. It turns out that you got lucky. You got in a company that has great you're product. Taking market. Orders. You're taking orders, right? That's going downhill. But most of the market, we have to drive the car up the hill, which means we need a strong clutch. And the clutch is the conversation between somebody who knows how to hold a good conversation that'll go to a meeting or hold a meeting that'll go to the right next thing, whatever that should be. Those conversations are the units that co connect the desire, the engine, the product to the market through the wheels on the other side of the transmission. And if you don't have them, you actually don't even know what you're doing. You literally are just talking to yourself. And that's what organizations do is just talk to themselves. Well, th th this then speaks to something else. Again, when, when you look at the average CRM, 80 plus percent of it is just total fiction or missing. And businesses are making critical decisions on investments in their future on the basis of this fiction called a, a forecast. Most sales pipelines, as far as I can uh, see, are either like a pencil because there's fuck all in it, um, or they end up looking like this old pair of granny knickers bulging in the middle, uh, full of um, call me back, send me information, call back in six weeks, all that kind of shit. And there's nothing of any value at the bottom end of the funnel. 
a good funnel looks like a funnel. It's wide at the top, rapid disqualification, and it's packed from the middle to the bottom with quality. But there is no quality assurance in almost any sales organization. It's basically focus on filling the pipeline with anything, whether it's real or not. And so forecasts that businesses are making important, critical strategic decisions on are utterly unreliable. Then you end up with businesses having to put critical strategic decisions on hold. And the ripple effect through lack of alignment, lack of communication, lack of competence, the the wrong measures and metrics. I mean, the the kind of measures and metrics um, that salespeople are being measured on are utterly the wrong ones. I don't give a fuck how many dials you make. I'm really interested in how many effective conversations you have on a daily basis or per hour. That's a much more fun metric because that that gives you some hope. Um, I'm really not interested in first meetings. I'm interested in second meetings. I'm interested in the number of qualified opportunities moving through to closable. I'm interested in the velocity with which uh, opportunities move through the pipe. With those four metrics, I've actually got some clarity. But the problem is that, by and large, no one's measuring that stuff. They're measuring um, irrelevancies, and they beat people up. And the VC or the private equity company is saying, well, yeah, we need to fill the pipeline up. So they pull this stuff forward, and people lie routinely. So now you've got 10 salespeople listening to nine other people lie from this work of fiction. So now for every minute, you lose 10 man minutes, and you, you just think... There is no sanity in this. Um, I, I, I keep using the word profession, but it's not. It should be. Because sales is a noble profession when done well. And it's crucially important. But it, it's just been relegated to this pin factory where you've got you know, marketing feeding into the SDRs, into sales, into customer success, into account management. Every time you get passed from one to the other. There's this massive disconnect. It's disjointed. You've got to start all over again. The customer's experience is shit. You know, your customer churn rate. You know, in uh, SaaS, 15% churn is considered okay. That means you've got to replace 49% of your customers every three years. Seriously. I mean, you've got to be a total ass to believe that that's acceptable. Yeah, I, it's funny that you mentioned manufacturing because I'm an old manufacturing guy myself. I came out of the world of building manufacturing systems. And when you do that, by the way, you spend a lot of time in factories. And it, factories are interesting because it's where we finally figured out how to do things with lots of people and lots of stuff that made sense, that works. You know, it, it's amazing what happened with what I'll call the Deming revolution and everything up through the to- Toyota production system. This stuff actually works. And it works on some simple principles. It, they can be applied to sales. So, you know, number one principle, do you know where your constraint is? There's only one. If you were to ask most people about the revenue organization or the revenue process, their sales process, and yes. So list the constraints, list the bottlenecks. They'll give you like nine. Well, okay. So now we've denied the entire history of mathematics because in a system, there can only be one bottleneck. That's why it's called a bottleneck, by the way. It's the only one. It's the neck. So what do, what do we do? We invest in everything. Why do we invest in everything? Let's fix this. Let's fix that. Let's get better data. Let's talk more. Let's blah, 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 blah. Well, in the, in the factory, we don't invest in everything. We only invest in one thing, the bottleneck. And we don't invest by guessing. First, we characterize it. And we make sure we know the flow rate, the cycle time, and the quality of the units going through that bottleneck step in the process. We all know how to do it in manufacturing. It's not hard to find the bottleneck. A bunch, it's your shape of the funnel thing. A bunch of inventory builds up in front of it. And downstream, they're either starved or they're in a glut condition, but they can't predict what's going to happen. So upstream, there's a big reservoir of inventory. And downstream, it looks like a crazy wild whitewater ride. So, okay, what do you do? You go understand it. What does that mean? It's not like, oh, we're going to grok it. It's like, uh, what is its throughput today? How many units can it produce? What's the quality? So for 
for those units, how many have to be rejected and sent back or thrown away or whatever? So what percentage are good and can be used in the next step for real? Not because somebody said so. And then what's the cycle time to make one unit? How, how long does it take? This is doable in sales. It's actually very straightforward, but you got to know what the units are. And the, the first order unit is you're going to convert inventory in the form of a list of people you want to talk with to actual conversations. And the denominator is always time. So now you have a throughput question. You, you just brought it up. How many conversations per hour with people on your target list can you have? Until you know that, you don't know anything. Until you do that, you're not doing anything. So that's your bottleneck right now. Your list is bigger. The, the list is the inventory. It's big. And downstream, they're either starved or there's a glut. It's unpredictable. And you can't forecast. You can't forecast whitewater. I'm sorry, it can't be done. Putting a number on it doesn't help because it's not smooth enough flow that you can say, oh, a little more, a little less. It's always like, I mean, they're going to sit here in a dry river or I'm going to drown. Those are my two choices. And I don't know which one I'm going to do. Okay, but th this then, we're, we're coming to the top of the hour, but I, I want to tackle this issue. Normally, your investor is a finance person, or they may be a retired dentist or a soccer player who happens to have some money, and they're not the market. The market are your customers. But these people think that by putting some notional, fictional guest numbers on a spreadsheet, they have a strategy. Um, and they're trying to measure stuff against massively flawed assumptions. And because their business model allows 19 out of 20 to fail, it, it strikes me that that kind of investment is largely luck and guesswork. And it probably has nothing to do with skill. One of the things that I'm, I found two VCs that I would be interested in working with, finally. Ten years of looking, I found two in a day. Altos and Stage 2 Capital both measure uh, success by customer retention. So they're patient capital, and they understand that what you keep matters more than what you make. But it, it flabbergasts me that... We've since Milton Friedman came up with the concept that everyone should worship at the church of finance on the altar of um, shareholder value. The customer has been utterly, utterly forgotten. And I look at the SaaS companies out there, their turnover rates, their churn rates. I look at the uh, amount of work that is created for the customer success team. I look at the number of customers that they take on that they never should have. And I just feel that we do such a disservice to buyers. Right at the top of the conversation, you said that these people are scared because it's their livelihood. And we do them a massive disservice. It's, it really is immoral how so many vendor organizations behave. Am I being just um, you know, idealistic? It just strikes me that this is completely wrong. And it breaks that whole piece around integrity right from the off. The minute someone from your organization phones a prospect, the integrity piece and the um, intimacy piece and the self-orientation are utterly skewed in the wrong direction. Yeah, I think the issue with finance is finance must, by kind of its nature, make sure that it doesn't know too much about what's going on inside the machine. It's like- The willful ignorance. They've got to be ignorant, otherwise they'd be the operators. So they might have the gimlet eye for certain kinds of things, but they probably don't, they're probably guessing. If they knew so much, they'd go make one, right? Or make a bunch of them. There are some exceptions. I think there are some folks who are great operators who get it and can see into organizations a little bit in a way that makes sense, but they run the risk of repeating their past successes as their future mistakes that they foist upon somebody else and force them to do. So that's a tricky one also. In both directions, it's, it's tricky. To me, the fact of the matter is, yes, I believe it is reasonably immoral, maybe completely, it's certainly unethical, to build a business with the intent of selling the business to somebody else before anybody realizes the customers aren't getting much value. 
the customers end up in certain popular areas, and I think sales tech is full of them, by the way, mm. where they buy stuff because everybody else is buying it, because it sounds good, because why wouldn't I? And then when they go to try to apply it, given the nature of, of sales and sales tech, it's about a two to three year process to figure out if you're really getting value. And so by the time that two to three year process runs, the individual responsible for the purchase has moved on because they have a 17 month shelf life and kind of away you go, right? So what happens when the, that vendor is flipped? We had a vendor in our space, a, a big one, a one that was worth a couple billion at one point, supposedly recently sold for, I suspect, a lot less than a couple billion a lot less onto a boneyard somewhere. I don't want to call them a boneyard, but they're a boneyard. And why did that happen? Well, when you come right down to it, they were really good at telling a story and getting folks to sign up and you know believe in the story and give it a whirl. But the actual production of value to the top line, because they were sales tech, so to the top line of those customers wasn't there. It wasn't measurable. It wasn't there. So fundamentally, their investors ended up getting whatever, you know, the investors could afford it. They're very, very big VCs and stuff like that. The principals walked away with something. The customers ended up holding whatever it is they're holding, which isn't producing much value other than, you know, otherwise the company would be worth a lot. I think part of this is just impatience too. The structure of most of these investment vehicles, these investment funds is they're closed-ended funds. So if you take money from them, say, say you believe, as I do, that it takes 10 years to figure out how to solve a serious problem. If you're assiduous about it and you're at it every day with real customers, and you're not really even worried about churn, you're worried about just their actual success. Are they really getting value? You're actually going in and saying, oh, we helped them produce this next thing down in their own pipeline, in their own funnel, and it's stuck there. We're going to help them with that. We're going to help them get a partner. We're going to. We're really serious about this flowing all the way through. It'll take you, if you're really good, about 10 years to figure out all the dimensions of that problem, make the partnerships that are, that are needed, endure to the point where you're making money so you have stare-down power against all the stupid shit in the world. 10 years is about it. 10 years is the lifetime of a fund. That means... Even a great venture fund, if you take their money anytime after year one, they're going to get impatient before you've sold, solved the problem. Because that fund comes to an end of life and it kind of is expected to be distributed to the limited partners. That's how it works, right? Mm. So 50% of all venture investments only give you five years to learn something that takes 10 years to learn if you're honest. Therefore, you're not honest because you can't afford to be. So uh, on that note, look, we've, we've come to time, sadly. But for anyone who's listening, make sure you listen back to my podcast with Alexander Knapp on solving wicked problems. These are problems that are way too sophisticated to try and fix in a linear fashion. And they are incredibly difficult. The first solution you put forward, the second, the third, probably won't work. All of your stakeholders come from um, come at it from a different perspective. You've got to track um, what's going on. You've got to keep learning iteratively. And ultimately, there is no perfect solution. There are only imperfect uh, attempts. And what we've been talking about here is really a wicked problem. And I, I think you'll all find value from having a listen to that. I'm hoping that we're going to be able to get Alexander on uh, a round table. And I think you'll enjoy uh, perhaps being on that one as well because of uh, the perspective that you bring. So, Chris, tell me this. You, you have a golden ticket. You can go back and you can advise the idiot Chris, age 23. What one choice bit of advice would you give him? You know, at 23, I did some really smart things. I left... I left uh, it took me seven years to get through college because I went off and climbed mountains and was a professional gambler and did some other things. That <laughs> stuff was really, really, really smart. At 23, when I got out of school, I would have been better off just to go ahead and plunge in and start a business, even though I learned a lot by going into some big companies. And I would advise myself, just you know, screw it. Just go start one because you'll get another 
seven, eight years of learning by having the shit beaten out of you. And yeah, I just exactly. think you cannot beat having the shit beaten out of you. Absolutely. Nothing beats a good drubbing for a decent life lesson. Yeah. Excellent. Okay. Um, tell me this then. What books, podcasts, audios, videos would you recommend people watch or listen to, read, to really expand their horizon? Well, this one, clearly. Absolutely. They be listening to you. <laughs> um, if they have some extra time left over, they could uh, they could take a listen to my podcast, Market Dominance Guys. It's at marketdominanceguys.com. It is not normal. It was just the attempt to collect material for a book on market dominance, a cookbook, not a theoretical book, but a how-to using the human voice conversations at pace and scale to dominate markets. It's 100 percenter. You can always do it. Most people don't believe it. So go give that a listen. Uh, and, you know, if I had one book, I would recommend that folks who are thinking about doing anything serious in business, well, for two, one is read Crossing the Chasm if you're in tech at all. I know you think you're beyond it. I know you think your stuff's beautiful. I know, I know, I know. You're wrong. People are repelled by your technology. It makes them feel physically ill. And the ones who need it the most are, are the ones who are most repelled, but they will hold their nose and buy it if it solves a broken mission critical business process for them. And if you make a whole product, not a part product. Jeffrey Moore has never been wrong about anything. I've known the guy forever. So go read his seminal work and really understand it. It's short. Even a salesperson can enjoy it, but it is shocking what it says. And then the other thing is there's, a, there's an autobiography written by a dead guy. And I do love a good autobiography written by a dead guy. So Richard Feynman's posthumous autobiography, the title alone would tell you he was a great physicist of the 20th century and uh, lived an incredible life. And Feynman's, uh, the title of his autobiography that was after he was dead, the first one is, surely you're joking, Mr. Feynman, but this that one, the title, really title alone tells you everything, which is, what do you care what other people think? Because the way you're going to screw up, fuck up, and wish you hadn't is you're going to care what other people think. And Feynman's dying wife said this to him when she was literally on her deathbed in New Mexico. And she realized that her uh, husband, precious guy to her, was starting to care what other people thought. And she stopped it. I can't stress enough, if you haven't read Richard Feynman, your life is definitely lacking. Just genuinely brilliant um, uh, insight, not only into humanity, but ma making things like quantum physics accessible to an Egypt like me. It's truly amazing and peppered with uh, essentially a fabulous party lifestyle. He's definitely one of the people I would love to have met. Um, excellent. Okay, so Chris, how can people get hold of you? Well, I'm pretty easy. The easiest way, I think, is just reach out to me on LinkedIn because I'm kind of loud out there. So um, come join in. I'm Chris Beal. I'm CEO of Connect and Sell. If that's too hard for you to find, you don't belong in the in the business, quite frankly. <laughs> um, and, you know, you can shoot me an email at chris.beal at connectandsell.com. Uh, if you want to take a test drive, it's mind-blowing. It's a full day of production, talking to 10 times more people. It'll make you sick. It'll scare you. Your little palms will sweat. But that's what I really, you know, if you really want to know what I'm talking about, get in the Ferrari, take it out in the track, scare the life out of yourself, and then think, however, speed might not be that bad if I could learn how to harness it. You, you guys are running a training program now as well. It's uh, Flight School, is it? Yeah, we run this thing called Flight School. It's uh, We just turn regular people into the top 5% of cold callers in the world. It takes about four sessions. You make money while you're doing it. Excellent. Chris Beal, thank you. Thanks, Marcus. This is Marcus Kauke signing off once again from the Inquisitor podcast. If you found this insightful, then please do get in touch. My email address is marcus at laughs-last.com. You can DM me on LinkedIn, and I'd be incredibly grateful if you can give an honest review, one star, three stars, five stars uh, on the podcast, Apple uh, Podcasts, Google, wherever you normally listen. And uh, if you think you'd be a good guest or you know someone who would be, then please drop me a line and connect us. I'd love to have them on. 
In the meantime, stay safe and happy selling. Bye-bye.